Young people excited about science. What a concept. Like I think about myself when I was growing up and it was always like, here's what you think and it's magic, right? Instead of really being introduced to the real world. And so I really do like the idea of young people who are, are not just excited about science, learning science, but promoting science. And these are two young people who are doing that very thing. I've got L and Bailey. Hi, L and Bailey. Hello. Hi. It's so good to talk to you. Okay, I'm going to start with you, Bailey. You're 14, is that right? Yes, I am 14. You wrote your yes. first book, Bailey, when you were eight, is that right? Yes, I did write my first book when I was eight. What was it called? Uh, my name is Stardust. And what's it about? It's about uh, many different things. Uh, when I was little, I just wanted the world to know about what I thought. Um, since I am an atheist or secular, whatever you like to call it. And I just felt like uh, I wanted children to know about uh, science. Okay. So. And... You wrote another book, or did you do some updates? What's the story on that? Uh, I'm doing a Kickstarter on uh, not a new book, but just a new cover in a larger size. And it has a forward by Richard Dawkins. So, And we're also going to do a Spanish translation. That's cool. You got the book there. Can you hold it up for me so I can see it? Oh, yes. So this is all three of them. So this is My Name is Stardust, the first edition, and then the other three. And then we got this, the new one. This is what the new one looks like. That's got to be fun, right? I mean, that's yes. a lot of work. People don't realize how much work writing a book is, do they? Girl? Yes. It's very, it's very hard. <laughs> Alec, can you hear me? You still with me? Yes. All right. So you are how old? I am nine. Nine years old, and you wrote a book? Really? Yes, I've written two, but my first one, I was eight. My dad helped me a little bit. My dad helped me more on my new one, though. All but, right. Well, and then I, I was eight when I wrote my first one, Wonderful Earth, and then my new one no. that comes out on September 1st. I got a copy over here, all right, which is why we're talking. Now, before I continue with you, both of you, I need to talk to your dad for a second. So can you guys tap yeah. him on the shoulder and give him a headset so he can hear me? Because I, before I continue with you two, I got to talk to a parent. Would that be all right? Yes. yes. All right. So let's put Doug or dad on the line. Give him a second to have a seat here. All right. There we go. Hey, I'll Dad. Down Glad down. you're yeah. there. Glad you're supervising. Okay. Hey, Seth. So I got to ask the hard question here at the front end, and it's a question that my viewers and listeners are all asking, and they should. I'm always cautious when it comes to young people. I come out of a culture where at an age before I knew a lot about anything, anywhere, I was sort of being propped up. I was being fed information. I was a reflection of my parents' worldview, and so... I was really echoing what they were saying and thinking. You know, I was on just kind of a something they put on the mantle, stuck on the stage, that kind of thing. So if somebody sees these young people, nine and fourteen years old, and they may have concerns that, you know, come on, how much do they really have to contribute? They're just kids. Are they just being used? So let me just ask you, Doug, I mean, how do you get around that? How would you address that concern or criticism when it comes to the girls and their work right now? Yeah, I mean, Seth, I'm, I'm so happy that we in the non-religious community question this type of thing, right? And we, we really need to. It's, it's really important. We're self-critical. You know, we, we challenge this type of thing. But I, I think if you step back, let me just talk a little bit about our philosophy on parenting. So, um, you know, as we had children growing up and we were a secular family and we wanted to learn how to how to teach our children, we studied philosophy, um, read quite a few parenting books. And, you know, one of the books we came across was Dale McGowan's Parenting Beyond Belief. And one of the themes that we came away from there was um, let's teach the kids how to think, not what to think. Um, and then because we love science, I'm, I'm, I'm really a science fanatic, started when I was in college at, at 17, just getting the chills learning about um, geology. Um, 
we, we, the best way that we found to teach our kids um, how to think is the scientific method. So we really started there, you know, and, and as they were little, we, we threw out little examples to them. And some of them were dumb when they were really little. But teaching them how to uh, use science as a verb, you know, this is a verb on, th- this is how you determine truth. This isn't truth. This isn't a dogma. This isn't something that you have to believe. And this is, uh, teaches them to question us as well, right? So if you, if you lear- learn, uh, if you use science as a verb that way, you know, as we drive down the freeway, we could, we could talk about rainbows and, you know, what's, what, what causes those, or, you know, if we heard something about, uh, crop circles, we could all come up with different hypotheses for what those were, including something crazy like, uh, um, like aliens, uh, you know, one, one example that we, we used and these are, this is, this is still, this is kind of dumb probably, but you could say Bailey, you know, what do you think would happen? What's a, what's your hypothesis? If you were to walk up to your older brother and tell him that his breath stinks right now, um, you know, my, my hypothesis is this, what's your hypothesis? Oh, I think he'll, he'll run and, uh, my, and, uh, and brush his teeth. Okay. That's a great hypothesis. Here are four other potential op- options there. One is he'll get defensive and, and he'll be really mad at you. Uh, so then you can test the hypothesis so you can go and talk to him. Uh, sometimes it's not one of the hypotheses that you came up with, but you tested it and you learned. So uh, these, these simple ways of, of teaching the scientific method, do you, we did that through experience experiments, you know, L and I did some experiments in the kitchen a few weeks ago and we had about 10 different chemicals. And she came up with hypotheses for what would happen with the different chemicals. And so we tested those, but that's a really a a way to teach how to use science as a verb. Um, Hey, Al, if my breath stinks, would you make sure and tell me like, probably you would tell me my breath stinks. (laughs) Probably I would want someone to tell me, I would want someone to get me in front of that. And then you could hypothesize as to what my reaction would be, but I would brush my teeth. I promise. Okay. (laughs) So uh, you aren't just sort of spoon feeding them the answer, but you are providing them opportunities where the gears are going off in their own mind. They get a chance to sort of pursue. Here's what let's experiment and let's see what the experiment results look like. Is that fair? That's very fair. I think, um, I think there, there's a fear among some of some of us in the secular community that our children will become religious. Uh, that's not something that I even worry about, right? Like, I uh, I think if we teach the children how to how to think like this, that they're gonna they're gonna discover truth. And I worry about them trying math. You know, I worry about them getting pregnant. I worry about some of these things. I I don't ever wake up worrying about this. I think if if someone grows up in a fundamentalist home where it's really extreme, which the, that wasn't the case for me, I could really under can really understand this fear. Um, you know, they they probably felt feel abused in a lot of in a lot of ways, and I I don't feel like I went through that, so maybe I don't have those scars. But these these children are are not taught magic when they're little, right? I don't teach them that people come back for, back to life, and you know we we talk about all the different religions and what all of them believe, and they all pick their favorite god. Like I think Els is, um, who, what's your favorite god? Poseidon. Poseidon is her favorite <laughs> god, right? So um, I think really, if you cheat, if you don't expose these children to magic and superstition, the likelihood of them becoming, uh, you know, fundamentalist, hardcore religion uh, in hardcore in religion when they get older is pretty low. You know, these kids aren't afraid of ghosts. You know, they don't walk around uh, worried about that type of thing. So it's not on their mind. And as they get older, if they start moving towards something like that, I mean, hopefully you could you could even ask the girls. Um, you know, we've told them that our love for them is unconditional. And so I think that's that's really how it is for us. And um, I, I can understand the fear from some people. And I think there probably are there, there probably are some, some things that we're dogmatic about. And my wife and I talk about this. And some of those things might be more in um, more in politics, you know, and so we have to be really cautious. You know, we're pretty liberal. And as we, I, as we Doug, I think it's fine for them to know where you are and why. I mean, you can defend your position and say, look, that we have a strong conviction about this. But there's a difference between you pleading your case and providing that information. You're going to influence your kids. I mean, we're not naive yeah. enough to say that there's not a bias or influence going on. But for sure. we also, I, I think we need to stop apologizing for rooting them in the real world. This idea that, well, you know, yeah, I told them that eh, magical things, there's no reason to believe them. We sort of say that apologetically. When the truth is, we should be able to say, 
you know, uh, there's no reason to believe any of this stuff. And, you know, if you find that magic is real, why don't you come and demonstrate that someday? But you're rooting them in the real. You know, there's a lot of evidence that says that people who are trained to think superstitiously when they get older, they have a hard time solving problems in the real world because they've been taught to think magically. So, I mean, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I think I'm on your frequency in that way, right? We talk about yeah, the same. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I think what we're seeing with COVID right now and some of the conspiracy theories that are being emailed to us from family members and friends, uh, you know, it's interesting to see the difference between people that, that believe superstition and those that don't and how they're they're looking at some of these um, the consp- they're straight up conspiracy theories of, of how things are, are, are coming about. So even that, that example right there, we, we've spoken with the, ch- with the children about, but I think we are, we're definitely on the same wavelength okay. and for, 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 for Bailey, this really started as science, right? I mean, she was a, she didn't really talk about this. Maybe you'll get into it with her, but she, um, she was in an area where it was 95% Mormon when we were growing up. Um, we were in a city called South Jordan, which is named after the river Jordan. And, uh, and so she was, she, she was being persecuted. She was being told she was going to hell. We had to go to counseling as a, as a father of an eight year old daughter. And when, when she comes to you and says, dad, I don't know if I want to be alive right now. Um, there's, I don't know if there's much worse that you can go through. And so that, that's where this actually came from. You know, we were watching cosmos as a family. We love science, right? So we believe that there's a third dimension to life that you can, if you can see things that are larger than yourselves for you, that's probably helping thousands and thousands of people in the secular community for us. You know, for me, that's science. For my son, it's hiking in the mountains. For Bailey, that's, you know, the, her, her books are, are, are about science. But it really started there. She learned that her bodies are made of sci- uh, a stardust. Like she said, she wanted everybody to know about it. I'm not a writer. I never knew she would be a writer. She asked asked if we would help her uh, structure that book. We actually, uh, we did a Kickstarter for the first book just because we didn't have enough money to do the, the um, illustrations at the time. And so it blew up from there. You know, her story of coming out of this um, persecution and, um, with a, with a positive message of, you know what, we are part of something larger than life. And, you know, you can talk to her about some of these things cause she's really passionate about it, but it really started with science. But that story, that backstory is what really, um, caught hold with, with, uh, some people at the freedom for Dan, Dan, um, from freedom from religion foundation heard the story. And that's where it really started with her, her, her activism. So that wasn't something uh, that wasn't a path that we were pushing for. It's not other, something we ever anticipated. I assumed that her first book, my, my name is Stardust would be on her shelf and maybe her grandparents shelf and a couple of our friends. Um, but it, it just really blew up from there, but her, her passion continues. So okay. it's, it's, it's cool as a parent to see. Your, I'm your kids. just doing my due diligence at the front end. And as interesting and fascinating as you are, Doug, I would rather talk to Ellen Bailey, yes. if that's okay. In fact, I saw I Elle have... yawn a second ago, and I'm like, oh, oh my God, man. I'm boring, Am I Elle. Not boring? I am so uh, sorry. I so I'm going to have boring. you give the headset and microphone back to yes. Bailey, if you would, and I'm going to finish this conversation with them, because they've been so very patient. Elle, yeah. you are Elle the humanist, is that right? Yes. Do you know what a humanist is? If I was to say, Elle, what is a humanist? What is that? A, hum- a humanist is a person... Who believes in they can be good without religion. Person who can be good for goodness sake, just because it's good to be good. That's a humanist. <laughs> Bailey, Pretty much. is it true that you started an SSA, a, a Secular Student Alliance chapter in your own school? Tell me about that. Yes, I did. And um, obviously it was really hard because um, very many people are religious where I live, even in Salt Lake City. But um it was definitely a changing point, and I feel like it's good to have a place, like a safe place for people who uh, do not believe in it, because it's definitely very hard, and I don't want people to go through what I went through, and I feel like if I gave people a place where they can um, come to and talk to people who aren't religious and secular, uh, I feel like that's a very... That's the main reason why I started a chapter there. Elle, do you ever talk to your friends about the kind of stuff you do, your book? Do they, are they interested? Do they understand? Well, most of my friends do know because I like to talk about it a lot. Like one of my friends, Penny, so, um, well, I'll tell this so it makes more sense. Everyone at my school, it was like the year that everyone was getting baptized eight and she asked me oh what church did you go to and I said I don't go to any church and 
she said she had never met someone that hadn't go to church or hadn't had a religion. And she thought it was super interesting. And then, like, one of my friends, Brinley, I mentioned her in a book a little bit, she um, knows everything about it because I'm super close with her. And she listens to everything I say because she thinks it's interesting because she's Christian and she doesn't learn about this stuff that much. So I'm glad to hear that they're not mean to you. That's good. Yeah, no, no one's been mean to me. Good. We have, that means people are listening. People like to talk about interesting things. And sometimes when you're talking, that's when minds are changed, right? People get to learn new things and they say, hey, wait, that's a better idea. Maybe I'll jump on that. Bailey, is it true that you took a tour of Ken Ham's Ark Encounter? <laughs> Did you go to the Ark Encounter? Yes, it is a very nerve-wracking experience. Why definitely. was it nerve-wracking? What was that about? Um, there was a lot of people that were judgmental, obviously. Um, I felt like I was going to be like, I don't know. It was just a scary experience for me. But I feel like once it was over with, it was definitely uh, one of the best experiences in my life. But there was one woman who told me who told on me to security because I was talking about how old the earth is next to one of the places I was like saying I was like only like 6,000 years old I'm pretty sure and I was proving it wrong and giving my theory and uh the woman went up to security and said she's saying stuff about it and you're obviously not allowed to film actually in the place so we just told the people that we were doing a, a, a school project and luckily we got to go through the rest of the arc because we could have been just kicked out you're not allowed to film in the arc because i totally did i took the camera <laughs> in and it was it was crazy they had a lot of weird stuff in there that to me didn't make a lot of sense did you have that same impression bailey like Yes, there was a lot of weird dinosaurs that I was like, um, I've I thought this I never knew this was like in the in the Bible, and there were just things in there that didn't make any sense at all. And I was just like, it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you too. When I look at you, and I think about myself when I was nine and fourteen, is it nine or eight? L, are you eight or nine? I am nine. Nine. Oh, well, I didn't mean to cheat you out of that extra year. Excuse me. Sorry about that. But when you get my age, you start to forget things and you have to ask. Okay. So nine and 14. When I was nine and 14, I wasn't asking very many questions. I just didn't ask that many questions. I don't remember anyway, asking a lot of questions. And I look at you two and I see you guys are just curious. You guys ask a lot of questions. Is that right? Yes, I do. And this nice. book, both of your books really represent that. By the way, and I only have the copy in my hand of L the Humanist. This looks a little like you, L. Is that you on the cover? Yes. I mean, I see pigtails, but I don't see pigtails right now on you. But your face <laughs> looks pretty familiar. You're a big star. Both of you are big stars. And I've got your websites on the screen. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. So... I want to make sure that everybody knows how to find your book, okay? So I'll start with you, Bailey, if they mm -hmm. want one of the earlier editions of Stardust or the new one. And do you know when the new one's coming out, the second edition? Um, it's on Kickstarter right now. I think it's launching. It launched last week on September 10th. We're almost to our funding goal, which is really good. And... The more we raise, the more languages we will be able to translate the book into for our international fans, you know. And uh, if you want to go uh, get my other books, it's at StardustScience.com. Stardust Science? Did I hear that yes. right? Okay. Yes. I've also got another one uh, website on the screen. Tell me if it's right. It says BaileyStardust.com. Is that website still good? Yes, that's still a good website, too. All right. L the Humanist, you tell me, is your book available now? Can you get it now? Um, yeah, you can also pre-ship it, and it's on September 1st that most people are getting it. And um, the books usually come with stickers, but not all of them. And 
to look for more stuff, you can go to elvahumanist.com and you can see more. Hang on. Hold on. Um, I got to make sure my book has stickers. Oh, look, I've got stickers. I've got an <laughs> Elder Humanist sticker and I've got a sticker with the globe and it's got hands wrapping around and it says, here's a sticker that says, I believe in good. And we've got an SSA sticker. Oh, look, a bookmark. I've got a bookmark. <laughs> I won the lottery. You guys send me amazing stuff. And if I ever meet you in person, I want autographs on both of my copies. Would that be okay? Yes, yes, definitely. Okay, well, I'm going to send everybody to the websites to help support what you're about. You guys inspire me. You guys oh, are little you. scientists. You are doing science. You're living science. Would it be okay if I read the foreword from Dr. Daniel Dennett from the book for my audience? Would you guys like to listen in while I do that? Yep, definitely. All right, it's real short, but Dr. Daniel Dennett was kind enough to lend his voice to the foreword. And it says this. This is a book of good thinking about important things. Grown-ups call this kind of thinking philosophy, which comes from ancient Greek words meaning love of wisdom. What this book shows you is that philosophy does not have to be complicated or difficult. Good philosophy just has to be clear, and it has to explain whatever it says so you know the reasons why it is wisdom. One of the important features of this book is that it tries to speak to everyone, no matter what they believe, so it tries to speak to you. Does it succeed? Did you give it a fair chance to succeed? All you have to do is read it carefully and see if you agree. If you don't agree, see if you can say why. Then check your answer and see if it's a good answer, an answer that everyone ought to agree with. If you succeed, you too are a philosopher. Welcome to to the club. Daniel Dennett, University Professor of Philosophy at Tufts University. And of course, Dawkins did the uh, forward to the upcoming edition of Stardust. Both of you, thanks so much for letting me talk to you today and all Thank success you. with your books and your science and exploration of the world. You guys be safe out there, okay? To you as well. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>